What's up, y'all? So, as you can see here, my uh, my front end tray was pretty rough. And there was a few issues with it before I even started. The rain chain that did absolutely nothing, and the post, which was sagging by three inches. You can see here why, because the post actually missed the foundation it was supposed to sit on, so they kind of just stuffed some blocks underneath. Hence why it's sagging so much. So I started off this project by removing a portion of the concrete slab. That way I can access the drain and remove the post. So the plan is to replace the post with a better looking one. I put up a couple of 2x4s to support the area which the post was supporting. So once it was free I removed the post and then cleared out any of the rubble that was in its way. So I ran a new section of drainage pipe which I connected to the new run. I just moved it a little bit closer to where the post is going to go so that way the down pipe can sit flush against the post so it's like kind of nice and tidy and neat and tucked out the way. Once I was happy with the position I filled up a bunch of dirt and rock to secure it in place. I then packed it down to give a good bed for the new concrete to sit on. Once that was complete, we can make a start on the formwork. So the idea for the concrete wall is for it to sit half on the existing slab and half overhang it. So we dug up about 12 inches around the perimeter of the existing slab and then about 6 inches underneath. That way the concrete wall can sit on top, overhang and anchor itself underneath, giving that extra little bit of support. Once we had finished digging around the perimeter, we removed any of the loose dirt and then compacted it down to create a good solid bed for the new concrete to sit on. I wanted the final height of the bench to be just shy of the trim around the window. So I made a few marks and then I set up my laser level pointing towards those marks. But then along the long run of the slab, I measured from the floor to those laser marks. For the construction of the form, I'm using 3 quarter inch paper back plywood, which is designed for concrete. I transferred those measurements to the plywood and then I cut them with my track saw. I then cut a 45 degree angle on one end. This is going to act as the inside corner. Because I didn't want any holes on the inside of the form, I attached my bracing from the outside. As I'm using 2x4s for my bracing, I set my countersink up to 2 inches deep and then I drilled a series of holes. I then attached the 2x4 to the outside of the plywood using 2 inch screws through those holes that I drilled. I did this top and bottom, staggering the 2x4s to the plywood. I then flipped it over to check I even screwed any screws too deep. I made a mark 6 inches away from the existing slab and then measured from the house to that mark. I then transferred that measurement down the run of the slab so that the concrete form will sit parallel to the house. I screwed a few blocks to the underside of the form and then brought the form into position. To attach the inside run of the form to the concrete, I drilled a quarter inch hole with my masonry drill through the wooden block into the concrete. I then cut a couple of pieces of tie wire and bent them in half, and then stuck them in the quarter inch hole. Once the two pieces of tie wire are in the quarter inch hole, I beat in a quarter inch framing nail. This acts as a great temporary fixing so that I can remove the form once the concrete has dried. I then start by bracing this section of the form. I then attach another piece of wood about two feet away from the form into the concrete. 
using the same techniques as before. I then cut a 45 degree brace that sits on the floor and the top of the form. I fix the bottom part of the brace to the block that's fixed to the concrete. I then screw the top of the 45 degree brace to the top of the brace on the plywood of the form. Adjusting the screw in and out until the form sits level and plumb. Once that first section was locked in, I transferred the measurement to another sheet of plywood to cut the remaining piece of the run. I attached the piece of plywood to the bracing using the same techniques as before. Here you can see what I mean by staggering the bracing to the sheets of plywood. This is so you can lock a couple of pieces of plywood together. Using a straight edge and a roofing square, I marked the perfect 90 degree angle on the inside corner of the form. And then along that straight line, I took some measurements from the existing slab to the laser level. I then cut those measurements out on a sheet of form ply and I put a 45 degree angle on one end. I pinned the corner together using my brad nailer to temporarily hold it in position. Once I was happy with the position, I added a couple of braces top and bottom using the same techniques as before, except I made them an inch and a half longer and you'll see why in a minute. I screwed the inside braces together at an angle and then braced the whole run using the same techniques as before, ensuring that it's perfectly plumb and level. I then cut and scribed the end of the form around the existing concrete slab. Because I wanted my concrete bench to be 12 inches deep, I cut this piece at 13 and a half inches, allowing three quarters of an inch either side for the return plywoods. I also cut the top at a one degree angle to allow for rainwater to roll off away from the house. I then took a bunch of measurements for the outside run. I measured from the inside and then added 12 inches. This should give me the measurement for the length. I then cut out and braced the next section of form ply using the same techniques as before. I dropped that section in and then I attached it to the end using wood screws. Once it was attached and square, I then adjusted it till it sits level and parallel. Once I was happy with the position and how it sit in, I brought in the next piece. You can see here what I meant by extending the bracing past an inch and a half. It allows you to fix the bracings together, rather than just relying on the screws going into the plywood. I'll show you exactly why this is important when we come to pour the concrete. I finished off the remainder of the run using the same techniques as before, making sure it's level and plumb. I also added a couple of 12 inch braces across just to help it keep in line. On the end of the run towards the house, I fixed a couple more blocks so I can attach it to the concrete. I then cut and scribed the end cap, ensuring that the two runs are 12 inches apart. Once I was happy that the corner is sitting level, plumb and square, I fixed in the last piece using the same techniques as before. Once I was happy with the level and I had a one degree fall from the inside to the outside, I marked the height of the end cap. I then fix the end cap into position. I 
I add a couple more braces on the other end using the same techniques as before. So here you can see I didn't allow for the thickness of the plywood when I cut the braces. But that's okay, you can really see how this technique will hold up. I attach the braces to the outside of the form in a similar fashion to what I used on the inside. As it's slightly higher than the inside, I put in vertical braces so I can put my 45 degree supports lower down. And then instead of attaching the 45 degree support to a wooden block in the concrete, I attach them to a stake in the ground. I attach the braces to the form and the supports using the same techniques as before adjusting level and plumb where needed. I then continue to throw in braces wherever possible. It may seem like I'm going overboard with the braces and to be honest, I thought I was as well, but oh boy, was I wrong. If I can give any advice when building a concrete form, and honestly, if I'm gonna do it again, I'm gonna brace, and brace, and brace again. Because this end of the run was right against the house, it was really difficult to get any fixing, so I ended up just wedging it from the house, and it worked really well. Because this bench sits outside, I don't want it to trap in rain, so I drilled in a series of three quarter of an inch holes, running parallel from one end, making sure I don't sink my counter bit all the way through the play. I then wedge in a piece of three quarter inch pipe going from the two holes. These will stay in when we pour the concrete, allowing for drainage holes. I continue this process down throughout the run. I then caulked any gaps to stop any cement coming through. I then with any larger holes filled with expanding foam. I added a whole bunch of rebar for structural support and I got this rebar for free hence why there's so many different thicknesses. I essentially created a cage going down throughout the whole run, keeping it a minimum of two inches away from any surface. This is so rust can't transfer through to the finished product. I also want to add that the form ply we used came pre-oiled. This helps when removing the form from the concrete. Now it's time for the fun part, the concrete pour. Up until this project, I knew very little about concrete, how it works and how to work with it. So I brought in my friend Dustin, or Dirty D, how he likes to be called, to help out and keep me in line. He is a concrete professional and knows pretty much everything you need to know about concrete. For our concrete mix, we use a 3-2-1 mix. Three parts stone, two parts fines or sand, and one part cement. In our mixture, we use standard Portland cement, Navijack, which is a pre-blended material, which consists of sand and stone, and we added water to get the right consistency that we wanted. For an added strength, we also used a quarter inch fiberglass reinforcement material called Admixture. As I added the concrete to the form, Dustin, using his plug-in vibrator, yes, insert joke here, vibed all the bubbles out from the concrete mixture. And you can see here in three, two, one, why it's important to add more bracing. Brace, brace, and brace again. So the weight of the concrete and the force of the vibrator completely pushed the braces out. So I had to run around and add a bunch more braces, which was not ideal. Continuing the same techniques as before, we filled the rest of the form up with concrete. Once the form was full, Dusty began to remove any excess concrete that wasn't needed and created a smooth finish with his trowel. 
And as you can tell from the change of light, it took a long, long, long ass time. Thanks again, buddy. I owe you one. Exactly two weeks later, I began to remove the form from the curing concrete. During those two weeks, I covered the form up with a tarp to protect it from any rainwater. If you leave water on curing concrete, it can potentially leave a stain, which I did not want. Once the concrete had cured, I made a start to the cedar cap for the bench. I ripped a ton of one inch strips from a bunch of straight grain cedar 2x4s. And when I say a ton, I mean, I mean a lot, like there was, there was a lot. Out of some cedar 1x4s, I made these 14 inch by 10 inch by 2 inch seats. These are essentially what the slats are going to fix to. Because I don't want to fix the slats permanently to the bench so then I can either repair them if need be or remove them during the winter seasons. I attach them to these seats so it holds the whole thing together. You'll see exactly what I mean in a minute. I spread out these little caps 2 inches from one end and then 16 inches from each other. I then cut a bunch of the cedar strips the length of the concrete return. I began by attaching the first strip using wood glue and temporarily fixing it with my pin gun. As I wanted all my gaps to be the same, I used a quarter inch shim to help keep my spaces consistent. Continuing in the same process, I attached more cedar strips to the caps. Before the glue had chance to dry, I flipped the bench on its side, and then using a countersink and wood screws, I screwed in from behind into the cedar slats. This is so the bench cap can remain solid, but you don't see any physical fixings from the face. Once the front and back slats were attached to the cap, I made a start on the top slats. Using the same techniques as before, I used wood glue and my micro pinner to hold the slats in position. I used my square to ensure that they sit flat and square with each other. I made sure to use a spacer as well throughout the whole run to keep my gaps nice and consistent. These kind of details really stand out on a finished project like this. Using the same techniques as before, I backscrewed the slats to the caps. I continued the same process on the middle section of the benches. I ended up adding a permanent spacer to the first slat, giving it an extra bit of support. You can see here that I'm using the same spacer to keep that consistent gap throughout the two different benches. To get a nice straight clean cut, I use my track saw to trim the end of the bench.
I also use my track saw to clean up the join in between the two benches. And then using a pull saw, I clean up that little nub. I repeated the same steps on both ends. Because the section of the bench is 18 feet long, I broke the two benches up into two pieces. I continued the same steps as before, making sure my lines are nice and straight. Once I was happy with how everything was looking, I gave the slats a good sand with 150 grit sandpaper. I then cleaned up any sharp edges by hand. For the finish, I'm using Benjamin Moore's Arbor Coat Translucent. It's a super simple one coat finish that looks fantastic on cedar, as you can see. While that dries, I spray the concrete down with concrete sealer. This repels any water and it leaves it a kind of wet look effect. And on that note, this pretty much wraps up this episode of my modern entryway build series. This has to be my most ambitious project to date and I am so, so happy how it turned out. I will be releasing a new episode every Friday of my modern entryway build from the pavers to the post to the modern ceiling to the classy AF door. <laughs>